very often when I give um, lectures to general audiences, I'm asked what is science? And so, how do you define science? So then you say science is the study of nature. Now you run into a problem if you're talking to children, because children turn around and ask you what is nature? Now you can't define nature very well, so I looked for a definition of nature, and the best definition of nature that I found was in volume one, number one, of the journal Nature. All of you who are in science will know the journal Nature. Sometimes as you go along in your research, you would like to publish in the journal Nature. But in 1869, when the journal first came out, nobody knew of it, and they needed an editorial. And volume one, number one, the editorial was commissioned, and the man who was commissioned to write it was the famous biologist Thomas Huxley. Huxley did not write the editorial. Instead, what Huxley did, he translated from the German an essay written by the poet von Goethe in the 18th century. And what Goethe said was this. He said, nature, we are surrounded and embraced by her, powerless to separate ourselves from her, and powerless to penetrate beyond her. And you can't find a better definition of nature, then you realize that you are also a part of nature. Now, of course, what was the coronavirus? The coronavirus is a force of nature. And what you've experienced over the last three years is a force of nature. Now, there are many wonderful things about nature. And those of you who are students should realize this right now. When you're young, you worry less about nature. And then as you go along, you worry more about nature. You worry more about biology. In fact, you be everybody begins to worry about biology irrespective of the subject that they've studied as they grow old because they find that their biology is failing. And when their biology is failing, uh, they read a little bit more of biology. Now, of course, today you had a G20 meeting here. And in the G20 meeting, there was a lot of talk. And one thing that would have happened during the G20 meeting is that a lot of carbon dioxide would have been generated. So you might as well go and look at nature and ask how does nature generate carbon dioxide and how does generator and nature utilize carbon dioxide. And look at the global carbon cycle. The global carbon cycle is probably one of the most amazing things to look at. Everybody knows about it, but uh, nobody really looks at it and thinks about it for a while. You'll find there's an enormously wonderful economy in nature. If you find the, look at the plant and animal kingdoms, you will find that the plant and animal kingdoms are cooperating with one another in this marvelous way. One of them is utilizing carbon dioxide to produce carbohydrate. The other one's utilizing the carbohydrate to burn it, and in the process produces uh, carbon dioxide uh, once again. Can we produce energy the same way? The answer is no. We can't mimic photosynthesis. And when I walked into the Center for Interdisciplinary Science and Innovation, what I found was that uh, there was, as always wherever I go, uh, there was a laboratory for nanoscience and uh, uh, nanoengineering and all of that. Now it turns out that however much we try, we can't really mimic the wonderful economy of photosynthesis, where the energy of sunlight now is harnessed. And the energy of sunlight is harnessed in such a way that that energy goes into the building of organic molecules using carbon dioxide as the starting substrate. And that's what the carbon cycle here, which I have on this. There are biochemical cycles illustrated on the top left and right corners of the slide. On the left-hand side is the slide, which you will find everywhere in biochemistry textbooks, all the metabolic reactions. And on the right, you will find the Calvin cycle on top. Look at these closely. Nobody looks at them, certainly not because they're so well known that everybody thinks that they understand them. And when everybody thinks that they understand something, then of course, the one thing you can be sure is nobody understands anything. And therefore, look at these things very closely. You will get a much more, uh, you'll get a feeling of wonder about nature and how has all of this uh, really come about. Now, in homage to the NCRT, 
I must put the periodic table up. Uh, to be fair to the NCRT, I had the periodic table already on my slides before the NCRT decided to remove it. Now, where did all these elements come from? Uh, the periodic table must hang, it must obligatorily hang in the lecture halls of chemistry departments. I don't know whether your chemistry lecture hall has a periodic table there. If it doesn't have one, it should have one. The biochemistry lecture hall must have the metabolic chart hanging. And the one thing about charts which hang in lecture halls is nobody will go and look at them. And therefore, they will be there like a decoration uh, throughout one's career. As you go closer to them and look at them and examine them, you're again struck by a feeling of wonder. And uh, I've put only one red arrow. And that red arrow is in that row of elements where you have carbon and silicon. Now, if you look at the two most important elements today, what are the two most important subjects which we talk about today in technology, in innovation? We will talk about information technology and we will talk about biotechnology. Which are the two elements which drive biology and which drive information and computer technologies? One of them is carbon, the other one is silicon. These are the two elements that you have to really be worried about. There's no life anywhere without carbon. And you might also ask the question, why can we not replace carbon with silicon? because it's right down there in the periodic table next to it. The reason is that the chemical properties of silicon are completely different. And therefore, silicon is much more oxidizable. And remember the word that I say, oxidizable, because what is happening to all of us is we are getting slowly oxidized as we get older and older. And the one thing that I'm very sure of is that we are all aging at the same rate because we're all getting oxidized more or less at the same rate. So silicon is more oxidizable, so you can't really use it. Instead, you have a lot of sand outside, which is all silicon dioxide. Where did the elements come from? The elements came from the stars. So all the elements that you have on Earth, all the ones that you mine, everything that you use in technology, all of it was the Earth's inheritance when it was born. After that, we cannot produce elements. The synthesis of elements is the prerogative of the stars. And all elements are produced in the stars. There are few artificial elements that one can produce on Earth, in nuclear reactors and so forth, but they are a very small minority. Now I draw your attention to a book, which will be very useful for many of you to look at if you're students. Because occasionally, you must look at a book, uh, not at Twitter, not at Facebook, but at something which is written and between the covers of uh, a fairly large book, and spend some time with it to sort of crystallize your thinking. This is a book by Jacob Pronofsky called The Ascent of Man. And this is based on a BBC series which appeared in the 1970s, eventually came out as a book, and Bronowski was a theoretical physicist, a mathematical physicist, who was commissioned by the BBC to do a series on the ascent of man. How did humanity grow and how has it reached the stage where it is today? Bronowski discuss discusses the elements and he says in all the stars there are going on processes which build up the atoms one by one into more complex structures. Then what I have marked in red, Matter itself evolves. The word comes from Darwin in biology, but it is the word that has changed physics in my lifetime. So keep the word evolve also in your mind, because evolution is very important, and we will see why it's important as we go along. About carbon, Bronowski is practically poetic. He says carbon, for instance, is formed in a star when three helium nuclei collide at one spot within less than one millionth of a millionth of a second. This is 10 to the minus 12 of a second, a billionth of a second. Every carbon atom in every living creature, including yourselves, has been formed in such a wildly improbable collision. That means life itself is extremely improbable. In the universe, it's extremely improbable. Uh, we are fortunate to be alive and uh, <coughs> 
we should realize this. So I'm going to show you the timetable of evolution. I have taken this from the literature. It's from an article, the reference that I've given you at the bottom. It's from Science Advances 2017. I've annotated it in my own way to look at all the ages that have happened after the Earth was born. When was the Earth born? The Earth was born a little over four and a half billion years ago. Think of time scales, four and a half billion years. I'm repeating the time scale four and a half billion just to give you the kind of time scales in which geology and biology really work. When we come to the time scale for which human beings on Earth, that becomes only about 100,000 years. Human beings as we know them today. And then when we look at all the history that we study, that comes to less than about 5,000 years. The result of this is every conflict, every disagreement, Everything in the world is the product not of biology, not of geology, not of nature, but of human evolution, cultural evolution over the last 5,000 years. So on the grand scale of science, most things that you worry about on a daily basis are irrelevant. When did life evolve on Earth? If Earth was four and a half billion years old, it turns out maybe about 500 million years after the earth was born. That might be when the first sort of bacteria or archaea made their first appearance on earth. What happened for 500 million years or a, a billion years? All that happened was chemical evolution, which is why at the top of the slide I have put geology and chemistry. When I went in the morning, walked into your campus from the guest house, and I was shown around, I saw the department. There's a chemistry department, there's a biochemistry department, there is a geology department which I was looking for, but I didn't really uh, see it. But this is how the subjects appeared. Geology came first, almost parallelly with geology, chemistry was there. Biochemistry came later. Microbiology began much later on Earth because microbes have to evolve before microbiology came along. Zoology came before botany. So if you're looking for an order of precedence for the departments, you might actually put microbiology above, geolo above botany and zoology. Now I'm sure in a university when you set up departments, uh, botany departments and zoology departments probably take precedence over microbiology departments, but not in evolution. This you must remember. You also see that botany came later. Animals came before plants. In many ways in biology, plants are more complicated. Plants do more. The more complicated the chemistry, the more complicated the biochemistry, the later it is going to happen in evolution. And last of all comes medicine, which is our most popular subject. Medicine actually happens only after human beings begin to separate themselves from the animal world. We are all animals, and as long as we were behaving like animals, you know, true animals, uh, not human animals, as long as we were behaving like animals, we needed very few things. And it's only as cultures evolved that you begin to re have evolution and the evolution of thinking and medicine. So I've given you a general introduction to science, and now I will talk about the COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic is something that is being quickly forgotten, and uh, it will be forgotten the way we are very quickly over the course of the next one year or so. But you shouldn't forget it, because on the slide that I have, which was made a few months ago, there were 6.6 .6 million people dead over the world. The number probably is somewhere between 7 and 8 million people who died. So it's a very large number. Nothing on the scale has happened in living memory. Now over the coronavirus pandemic, we realized that there would be many ways of eliminating the coronavirus. And then human beings are generally very smart. 
And the smartest human beings very quickly found ways of eliminating the coronavirus. Two of them are pictured on this slide so that I am not accused of being partial to any one culture or civilization. Uh, you will find Donald Trump and you will find our own Patanjali and both of them eliminated the coronavirus in their own ways. Sometimes they did it with the... In fact, I still haven't forgotten Donald Trump standing in front of the television cameras. He was quite an actor and he asked, turned around and asked his science advisor, can't we just put uh, disinfectant into everybody's lungs? <laughs> and uh, that would have eliminated the coronavirus and would have probably also eliminated a lot of our problems. Now the cartoon at the bottom right, you may or may not be able to read it, so I'll just read it for you. Uh, here there is this stout man, uh, undoubtedly having a, a mug of beer, uh, rather happily, he says, I read that drinking beer can cure COVID and bring world peace. And obviously the person at the other end doesn't think so. So he says, probably fake news, uh, but why take a chance? And so he continues with his drinking. This is the way the public generally approach the coronavirus pandemic. Now, the coronavirus pandemic is the only thing which I think has popularized science. I have for many years uh, been assigned the task by different institutions of trying to popularize science in colleges. Because if you go to colleges, nobody's interested in science. Everybody's interested in commerce or management, uh, engineering or medicine. And uh, therefore, you need to be a very persuasive and uh, a compelling speaker in order to elicit even a moderate response among students. The coronavirus did this wonderfully. You can see here on the left hand side uh, there are policemen in Secunderabad wearing coronavirus helmets. There's an entire auto rickshaw now just dressed as a coronavirus in Chennai. And I picked all these in those days when we had nothing to do during the lockdowns because I knew I would be talking about these things. And in Italy and France, of course, they decorated their cakes, their Easter eggs, and so on. And it's wonderful because you need a sense of humor to get through the pandemic. And so the chefs in Italy, in Easter of 2020, when the pandemic was at its peak in Italy, they were in fact making in France and Italy all these cakes and eggs uh, in the shape of the coronavirus. But what did this do? This immediately taught us what the coronavirus looks like. Everybody can recognize the coronavirus, irrespective of the language that they speak. It's unified the world, and it's brought science to the public imagination. What is a virus? The best definition of a virus that I have found is in this book, written by the English immunologist, the famous popularizer of science, a Nobel laureate, uh, Peter Medaba. And the book is entitled Aristotle to Zeus, but it's called the Philosophical Dictionary of Biology. So there are many terms in biology. All you have to do is to look them up in Medivh's book. You'll find a little write-up about it. Now he describes viruses as a piece of bad news wrapped up in protein. And that's what viruses are. After all, they have genetic material inside. They have a protein coat outside. And uh, all that the protein coat does it, it helps it to lodge onto the target cell, deliver the DNA or RNA, depending on what kind of virus it is, into the host cell, and then the virus multiplies. So I think it's an absolutely good definition. I would only add that for the coronavirus, because it's an enveloped virus, you also have a phospholipid membrane, and that's what I've written below. So viruses are extremely simple, and as we go along, we'll ask the question, uh, where should we put viruses in the tree of life? Very difficult question. Coronavirus is the enveloped virus. Now I show you a picture. The top is now the immortal CDC representation of the coronavirus. They put this out and said anybody can use this picture. And uh, electron cryo microscopy has shown what the coronavirus actually looks like with the phospholipid bilayer and the spike protein stuck on it. That's what you see on the right hand side. But at the bottom, I put a picture of a man. This is William Osler, who is considered the founding father of modern medicine. More than a century ago, he said, soap and water and common sense are the best disinfectants. This was for students of medicine. 
And uh, this, of course, turned out to be the best advice during the coronavirus pandemic. So you would use soap. And what soap was doing was, since it's detergent, it was dissolving the phospholipid membrane of the virus and disintegrating the virus. If you used an alcohol-based sanitizer, it was doing exactly the same thing. So you, we were disrupting the virus. Of course, Osler also said that in addition to soap and water, you need common sense. And the one thing that seemed to be missing over the last two, three years is common sense. Our common sense, of course, is very uncommon. And uh, I don't know whether this thing will actually work, but let me see. It won't work here, so I'll move on. No, it doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. That's only for special effects. Uh, in case students have gone to sleep, they would be on that slide. A student made it for me, but I've never been able to pay because you're supposed to do something which allows the computer's microphone to be used and so on. But we won't worry about it. That's nothing but the signature tune from the Godfather movies. And in the signature tune from the Godfather movies is rather compelling. And uh, we should study the coronavirus and we should study it in great detail. Now, why should we do that? Because this is what Michael Corleone told us. He said, keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer. And uh, the Prime Minister also told us this right at the beginning of the pandemic, that the coronavirus is an enemy. And therefore, we are going to defeat the coronavirus just the way we defeated our enemies long ago uh, in the Mahabharata war and so on. So you will see that we should study enemies very carefully. So when the first lockdown was declared, and we were also told that we can't cross the threshold of our doorsteps. Our Lakshman Rekha has to be drawn there and don't go across it. So we didn't go across it. So I was stuck in front of my computer. And stuck in front of my computer, all I had to do was to ask some questions. And the question that I asked is, who discovered the coronavirus? Now I couldn't find out who discovered the coronavirus. So I went to the computer and began to look and I'll tell you what I found. I found this paper. This paper I found because the picture of this lady sitting with the microscope appeared in the New York Times and it appeared in the National Geographic. Her name is June Almeida. She's one of the first biological electron microscopists and she put a sample of the coronavirus under the electron microscope and got that image that you see in the middle. That's the image which gave the name coronavirus because you can see the spherical virus, circular cross-section with projecting spikes which look like a corona. That gave it the name. The man on the left is David Tyrrell, the most influential virologist of his time. He was studying rhinovirus or the cold virus. And it turns out that about 30% of common colds are caused by coronavirus. So the coronavirus was always there. And when he was studying the rhinovirus, the people who were studying the rhinovirus found the coronavirus. So David Tyrrell and June Almeida published this paper in 1967. And this is really for those of you who are PhD students and who are sometimes tasked with reading some paper. When you read a scientific paper, which is going to be useful to you, you must read it carefully. And when I say you must read it carefully, you must read everything in it. In fact, you should read everything in it except the introduction and the conclusions. Because if you read the introduction and the conclusions, you are biased by what the author has told you. But if you read the results and you look at the legends and all the figures, you will find out what the author has done and then maybe come to your own conclusions. So in this paper, the, the picture is of two viruses and they are mentioned here, 229E and B814. These are just numbers that scientists give the sample which they have. Sometimes it's the page number of the book. Sometimes it's the registration number of the student from whom the sample of the virus has been drawn by taking nasal secretions and so on. Because this was done primarily in uh, medical institutions and the guinea pigs were medical students who had colds. A very important topic was touched by him today about the uh, science uh, and then uh, coronavirus. Uh, of course, I did miss some of his slides, but everything in a very 
clear terms he explained in a very simpler manner which uh, you know i could even understand very clearly uh, of course i would uh, you know ask dr altaf to have some type of uh, interaction with the students uh, with professor balram because uh, you know it's a great opportunity for us also and for them also uh, to be face to face with such a reputed scientist of a country and then to interact uh, with him i really congratulate uh, siri uh, dr altaf and his team uh, for pursuing uh, professor balram to be here uh, and giving this wonderful uh, lecture we do look uh, forward to professor balram to give us uh, such types of opportunity in future also because interacting personally with such a personality is itself a learning experience uh, not only for the faculty but also for the research scholars uh, and students thank you uh, professor balram very much for being with us it's been a pleasure uh, to have you here and uh, as vice chancellor i request you uh, to spare some time more uh, whenever we need you so that our students and faculty can be uh, benefited and uh, you know from your slides i could uh, read and imagine how intensive uh, studying you do on articles which again is a learning experience for our students you know whoever has contributed in any science uh you know about the authors about the scientists whom you have mentioned i think uh, all our students should intensively you know study them because uh, you know you were touching the bases here bases there so in fact a learning experience for uh, everyone once again thank you very much for being with us and interacting uh, with the audience in this hall used to look forward to <laughs> professor balram's lectures and classes and personally it is a uh, it's a great occasion and an honor for all of us that professor balram has agreed to give a talk at kashmir university and gave us the opportunity to host him here at the university thank you sir for accepting the invitation and being with us today and to talk about reflections of science in in the age of coronavirus introducing professor balram in couple of minutes would be injustice to his achievements and his contributions to science in general and indian science in particular but i'll briefly you know mention it will take whole class to list his achievements and his contributions to indian science but i will mention some of the you know achievements for for general audience professor balram is currently professor of chemical ecology at national center for biological sciences bangalore he has served as director of the prestigious indian institute of science bangalore for almost 10 years and has served iisc as a faculty for almost 40 years his main focus of research has been peptide chemistry you know structure conformation and biological activity of designed and natural peptides using x-ray mass spectrometry and nmr you know professor balram has played a major role in indian science both by being the director of the iisc for nearly 10 years and also being the editor of a very influential science journal of the country current sciences where he has written extensively and has you know insightful editorials on all aspects of science policy like challenges in future of indian science he has been awarded the third highest civilian award that's called padma bhushan by government of india in 2014 for his contributions to indian science in addition to that he has been awarded the world academy of science award birla award or bruce merrifield award by american peptide society i think as i said in the beginning you know uh introducing professor balram in few lines would not be possible one 
you know, a big legacy that Professor Balram has, you know, established that he has produced a rich pool of scientists who are doing exceptionally well throughout the country and are contributing immensely to science and science policies. You look at his students who have been groomed and mentored by Professor Balram, you will find them in every corner of the world. And some of them are, you know, holding some of the prestigious positions. The current Deputy Secretary, Professor uh, Rajesh Gokhale, is the student of Professor Balram. So, without taking much time, so I would let us all welcome Professor Balram for today's talk on reflections on science in the age of coronavirus.